Welcome everyone to the Campaign for Social Science annual lecture. Uh, I'm Bobby Duffy and this is my first major event for the campaign in a new role for me as uh, chair. So I'm therefore uh, particularly delighted at such an important and timely subject that we're focusing on uh, today, on shifting social identities in the UK. And, and that we have such an excellent speaker in Mark Easton, Home Editor of BBC News, and uh, such an expert respondent in Professor Maria Sobolewska uh, from the University of Manchester. Uh, we'll hear from Mark and Maria shortly, but first I wanted to say how delighted I am in general uh, to take over the role of chair of the campaign at such a crucial time um, when making a clear case about the real value of the social sciences and what it brings in improving decision making to society, individuals' lives uh, is more vital uh, than ever. The campaign was formed by the Academy as a key initiative in making this case, and it relies entirely on the support of a host of individuals and groups, many of them in this room uh, today, including Academy Fellows, who are very welcome, a number of universities who form our supporters uh, scheme, an excellent board drawn from across uh, the sector, and of course a small but very dedicated uh, staff, uh, including our great new Chief Executive, Rita Gardner, who was instrumental in uh, encouraging me to take on this role, um, which I'm very grateful for, uh, Rita. Uh, we've been working with each of these groups um, to develop our refresh strategy, building on great work that's been done in the past from previous chairs, including people like James Wilsden and Shamit Zagar. Uh, and we'll be launching the new strategy in the coming months. Um, the aim is to draw on our incredible assets, uh, which are mainly, again, you and our other supporters. And then a couple of other things. I think our, our clarity of purpose in being a campaign, uh, having that in our title and at the core of our objectives. And then secondly, our dedicated focus on social sciences. Uh, we have this very clear remit. I hope that we can use these to be of service to the sector uh, as a whole, which will mainly be through communica communicating with clarity uh, and consistency the vital importance of your work, all of your work, and achieving this by crucially working in partnership uh, with the many friends and allies uh, that we have inside and outside of the sector. Um, we have a lot of friends uh, uh, who understand that good decision making uh, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and instead, it needs an understanding of how societies and individuals both think and act. Uh, so that includes hugely contributing to the grand challenges of our day, understanding individuals and societies' response to climate change, uh, clean growth, our aging population, how new technology and AI interact at an individual and societal level is a core element of good decision making on this, not optional. So we'll communicate the campaign's refresh strategy directly to all of you, uh, but we're keen to hear your views uh, at the same time. So get your ideas in to us. Uh, please do get in touch with me, with Rita, other members of the board, or your other contacts in the Academy and uh, Campaign for Social Science. Uh, one of our key friends and allies uh, in this work has been Sage Publishing, and in particular, oh, I like that, yes, we need more audience participation in this. Uh, and in particular, Ziad Marar, another clap, <laughs> who is global president of publishing. Uh, Sage have kindly sponsored this evening, and before we introduce Mark, uh, I'd be delighted if Ziad would uh, say a few words. Ziad, please. It's wonderful, actually, to be here on what I think might be the occasion of the seventh um, lecture of uh, SAGE and the um, Campaign for Social Science, and to welcome you all here again. So many of you have heard me talk seven times or six times already, um, but I promise to be brief. Um, I was thinking, actually, just uh, it was a couple of months ago that I went to the memorial of one of our authors, Professor Rom Harray, who... Many of you will have read and known um, as an eminent figure in philosophy and social science. And, um, but I think what's probably slightly less known is that um, his, orig his starting point in academia was as a physicist. And it seems relevant in terms of that perspective that when looking at uh, the last book that he published with Sage, um, that he opened it with this phrase that struck me, which was, the universe is composed of exactly two things, molecules and meaning. And 
the implication being that there is a whole set of fields which are engaged with understanding the one and understanding the other. And I found it quite a telling way to think about what the social sciences and the related fields that are looking at understanding meaning are engaged with. More prosaically, but equally importantly, um, I noted a month ago um, that the uh, government's chief scientific officer, advisor, um, Sir Patrick Valance, um, put up on a slide um, the 700 ARIs, the um, areas of research in interests that at least 14 government ministries are engaged with right now. Um, and they, they range from smart cities to immigration to knife crime, you name it. Um, but the striking point was that he said that fully 63% of those 700 ARIs would benefit from a primarily social science approach. And so in two different ways, I've had reason to think about the value and importance of social science. And it's been central to Sage's identity since our founding. As many of you know, Sarah Miller McCune started the company as a 24-year-old um, in the, you know, nearly 55 years ago. Her birthday today, so well done, Sarah. But um, I kind of was thinking that it's the animating spirit that started out with her view about social science's importance in creating healthy minds and healthy cultures that is as true today as it ever was at SAGE. And so it's for that kind of reason that SAGE is so deeply aligned with the aims of the Campaign for Social Science, of the Academy of Social Sciences, and various other bodies that we work with around the globe. Um, it's profoundly important to us to help the important work that we believe our friends at the campaign are doing such a great job of leading, leading out on. In particular, we, we've spent a lot of time lately on the question of, sort of impact and value um, and trying to engage with it on a number of dimensions. Um, the first of which, obviously, as you might expect from an academic publisher, is, is looking at the dimension of, sort of scholarship and education and looking for ways to try and get beyond the sort of blunt traffic of metrics, short-term assessments of the value of social sciences, recognizing that the impact in scholarship can be diffuse and long-term, and in fact have put out a prize for the most um, cited articles from 10 years ago that we're going to keep rolling forward each year as a way to try and bring out that perspective. But we're working with people like Google Scholar and various other people to try and think about ways to broaden an understanding of social science impact in a scholarly dimension. And on the educational side, to think not just about the domains in which um, students are being taught, but also to think about the way that they are bringing a social science imagination to the, to the le lessons and study, and in particular with a view to thinking about critical thinking. Um, Beyond then scholarship and education, we're obviously interested in the impact on policy making, evidence-based policy making, as no doubt everyone in this room is, is keen on. Um, we um, work with our various individual contributors and authors uh, to help help that bridge to policy impact um, happen a bit more easily and a bit more transparently. Um, and it's complicated, but it's an important area in which we're engaged. Um, the third area, when we look at impact and value, is around working in the practitioner space, thinking about the various people who use social science in different ways. Um, and, and we're particularly interested in the social media technology companies in that regard, and have um, our third social science foo camp this weekend in the belly of one of the beasts, Facebook, in, it, in the, um, their headquarters at Silicon Valley, where we bring together through an unconference academics from social science and other fields, but data scientists, computer scientists, writers of different kinds to try and create a cross-pollination and a mutual understanding to hopefully enable social science to have that broader kind of impact. And then the final area um, is really about social science's impact on the public sphere. Um, and we do that a number of ways. Um, we're engaged with the Conversation UK is one of the ways of doing that. And to do that well, we need great interpreters and translators. And so it's particularly apt then that this evening we've got Mark Easton, a renowned journalist who's always taken social science so seriously um, to be the, the uh, annual lecturer tonight, who's such an interpreter um, of the social science effort that he brings to bear on his journalism. I'm going to let Bobby do the introduction, but I wanted to say that it just feels particularly apt for SAGE, and we on behalf of SAGE are delighted to have you um, speaking at the lecture tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Ziad, and for your continuing support. We really value it. Um, so now, I know you want to get on to uh, Mark's lecture, so do I. So I won't say lots about Mark to start with. You'll be very familiar uh, with you. I think I'll only say, really echoing what Ziad said, uh, my particular interest in, in Mark giving this year's lecture is that I've always admired two key aspects of his reporting, I think, which is, firstly, his talent for storytelling and clarity, um, which is such a vital asset in improving the impact of our research. We need people to be engaging uh, with our evidence. But second, that he vigorously resists oversimplification, oversimplification for an easy headline, um, which uh, I've had that sort of conversation with him in our dealings around our research. It's not about finding the easy answer. Instead, he outlines the inevitable complexity and contentiousness of uh, social issues. But he does that while keeping that clarity. Uh, and he's not shied away from complex or contentious issues this night, uh, tonight, uh, talking about uh, identity, shifting identity in uh, the UK, uh, particularly contentious if you're a Tottenham fan, just to give you a heads up on some of his early uh, content. Uh, so, oh dear, <laughs> sorry Mark. Uh, so do feel free to tweet away during uh, the lecture on other social media, uh, hashtag campaign lecture. Uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome Mark Easton to the stage, please. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bobby. Those are really lovely words, so thank you very much. And it's absolutely my privilege to be uh, here tonight and to help celebrate social science. I, I'm wearing the badge. I'm proudly wearing the badge. I'm told it actually matches my tie, so all is good. Um, uh, and thank you very much indeed for, for talking about my, my journalism in such generous terms. Um, the, the BBC, my, my employers, as, as you almost certainly will have read, are, are going through another... Uh, sticky patch at the moment. Um, you may have, I want, oh, where's my slide? There we are. Um, you may have read something about it. Um, in BBC News, we have to say, we're always having to say, this time we're having to save 40 million quid uh, in two years. And the conclusion has been that the only way we can do that uh, is by a substantial number of job losses, which you may have heard about, and the reorganization of the way that the, uh, the BBC News operation sort of thinks and, do, and does its job. And it's a, it's a difficult time for, for many at the, at the corporation. However, um, you may be interested to know that as part of the reorganization, uh, the powers that have be have produced a Venn diagram. Um, we always need one of those. This is a Venn diagram of what are called story teams. Now, I don't know, you probably can't see it very clearly, but um, uh, this is how we're going to be divided up in the new slimmed down uh, BBC News. So as you can see, there are various story teams. There's planet and learning and politics and culture. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the, um, the, the largest lozenge there, you can see, is, is society, um, which means, of course, that uh, despite the cuts, however difficult and, uh, and painful it is for the BBC, there are opportunities for social scientists here, ladies and gentlemen. So there is a, a silver lining, perhaps, uh, to what is going on at the moment uh, at the BBC. I, I, I guess what I want to talk to you about tonight um, would inevitably fit into the society lozenge uh, because, uh, as Bobby was saying, it is about identities. So first, and Bobby's rather stolen my thunder, but first, a confession. Um, my name is Mark Easton, and I'm an Arsenal fan. Um, it, is, it is an identity that I wear around my neck. Uh, on match days, I also invariably wear Arsenal socks and Arsenal underpants. Um, because I know that if I don't, the footballing gods will conspire against my team, my tribe. Um, they don't always listen, of course, especially this season. Um, so why am I telling you this? Because, because I want to talk about identities and tribes in the context of the United Kingdom, a United Kingdom that doesn't feel very united right now, and the story of Arsenal please bear with me, I think is quite relevant to the discussion. So this is, this is the view from my seat 
uh, at the, on the upper tier at the Emirates. Um, and like many Islingtonites uh, who'd been on the waiting list for a, a season ticket for years at the old Highbury ground, it was only when the club moved to the uh, new and much larger uh, stadium, the Emirates, that we were able to get a guaranteed seat. So where I sit on the upper tier, you will find uh, lawyers, bankers, film directors, journalists, novelists, along with people from, from all other backgrounds. But you know, there are the professionals who moved to North London when it got trendy in the 1980s. But there are also people from really every social classification and every ethnicity. On the lower tier, I would say it is a significantly different demographic. These are the seats that were offered first to the existing season ticket holders from the old ground. And as a result, it's a much more traditional, white, male, working class crowd. Arsenal, like many of the early members of the Football League in England, came out of the uh, factories and mills of the Industrial Revolution. It was, it was workers, there they are, at the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich who started the club, encouraged by employers and an establishment which saw in rules-based, organized sport activity that promoted solidarity and healthy competition, and crucially, a controlled release for male aggression, both on the pitch and in the stands. And there is a song that um, Arsenal fans uh, have traditionally sung, uh, which goes, we hate Tottenham, and we hate Tottenham, repeated twice. Um, before the final line, we are the Tottenham haters. <laughs> what the chant lacks in poetry, I think it gains in clarity. <laughs> Ever since Arsenal moved from Woolwich to North London in 1913, close actually to where Tottenham Hotspur already played, you can see how this might go wrong, uh, the supporters of the two sides have basically defined themselves in part by the detestation of the other. Identity, I think we can agree, is not only who we are, but who we are not. And for traditional Arsenal fans, they are definitely not Tottenham. Um, there is a, a, another Arsenal chant uh, along similar lines, which goes, stand up if you hate Tottenham, sung for reasons lost in the uh, mists of history to the tune of Go West by the Village People. <laughs> Really don't know why. Um, now, at this, the lower tier will stand up almost as one. The upper tier, however, I've noticed, is much more reluctant. From my seat, I can see some of the banners which have been fixed to the upper tier by the football club. There they are. Gay Gunas, Arsenal Kenya, Hakuna Matata, Arsenal, Germany and Slovenia, Nepal, Italy, Peru, the Seychelles, Arsenal, Mumbai and Australia. And uh, some in the upper tier do like to applaud the, um, the Arsenal for every, there it is, the Arsenal for everyone banner, embracing diversity and equality when that's brought out. And this is clearly a very different vibe from we hate Tottenham. It's partly, of course, about global corporate values. Arsenal is big international business. But it also changes the nature of the Arsenal identity. It was once an exclusive identity, a white working class, largely male identity. Now it's an inclusive identity, Arsenal for everyone. The big change came, I think, with the move from Arsenal's previous stadium just up the hill in Highbury. Now, the architecture of the old ground was in the traditional classic style of the designer Archibald Leach. If you imagine a football ground, you're almost certainly thinking about something designed by Archibald. High, straight, almost windowless walls enclosing the pitch. Season tickets were scarce and passed down families across generations. Now, the Emirates is glass curves. You're encouraged to look in. It's welcoming in a way that the old Highbury was intimidating. The crowds are far more diverse by ethnicity, nationality, gender, age, wealth, in every way. 
Arsene Wenger. The multilingual polymath, the professor, the philosopher, the European who managed the club to such success in the 90s and noughties, steering the club to the new stadium. He symbolized the Emirates' inclusive character. He was everything the old days of, of hooliganism and racism and sexism and fights in pubs were not. In 2018, as Britain struggled to complete its departure from the EU, Arsene Wenger was forced out of the club. His opponents in the stands called it Wexit. I'm not going to pretend that, uh, that Brexit and Wexit are the same, but I do think there is an important philosophical divide present in both that relates to our identity, and I'm going to call it islandness. And what do I mean by that? Well, John Donne was quite wrong when he said, no man is an island, because this is to completely misunderstand the nature of islands. They are not closed systems unaffected by the outside world, entire of themselves. We are all islands in that we are individuals bounded by the attributes of our bodies and our minds, but shaped by all that washes up on our shores, the experiences and influences that come from outside. Islandness, then, is the balance between those two aspects of our identity, the part that is individual and separate and the part that is connected and open. Britain is proud of its island status, tradition and heritage, a way of life framed and protected by white cliffs and rocky shores are central to the character of the nation. But Britain is also a country that wants to reach beyond its boundaries, to be part of a bigger conversation, open to new ideas and embracing change, taking the risks that keep an island from ossifying and stagnating. And that contradiction, I think, is the source of the storm over Brexit. It helps explain the furious waves crashing, not just on my own island's shore, but on communities and nations around the world. It is about the contested nature of islandness, where nationalism meets internationalism, local meets global, people looking in, seeing people looking out. I wanted to test that sense of British islandness. And I found a proxy for it. I'm so excited about this. I found a proxy for it using Hansard. I searched for the phrase island nation from the earliest records in 1800 to the present day. It turns out the expression was not uttered by any parliamentarian in the entire 19th century at a time, of course, when Britain saw itself as builder and commander of a global empire. The first occasion it crops up is in 1904, when an MP referred to Britain as an island nation of island people lying as we do between the old world and the new. Perhaps its use on that occasion marked a moment of anxiety, a niggling worry that the tectonic plates of power were shifting along the mid-Atlantic ridge. But the phrase didn't catch on, as you can see. It, it, it cropped up fewer than 50 times in the next 70 years. There was a brief flurry in the early 1980s as MPs and peers discussed the Falklands War and the decline of the UK's once dominant shipbuilding industry. But if the language of the Houses of Parliament can be used as a measure of Britain's sense of its islandness, then it has reached levels never before seen. The phrase was deployed more times in the three years after the EU referendum than in the first 180 years of Hansard's record. We have a foot on both sides of this debate, our own personal continuity versus change settings, the emphasis and importance we place on protecting what we know and what we have, and, the, and, and uh, at the same time being open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. Arsenal fans, 
can rejoice in the history and heritage of the club while also wanting it to be modern and progressive. Similarly, I think there is a danger in trying to characterize the leave-remain split too rigidly. The practice of describing people, places, regions and nations as leave or remain polarizes the argument with binary description that fails to reflect the nuance behind the choice and indeed behind the result. London is often described as a remain city. But actually, you know, more Londoners voted to leave the European Union than voted for Sadiq Khan to be their mayor. Even in that most pro-Brexit town of Boston in Lincolnshire, a quarter of those who took part opted to remain. Voters had a whole list of reasons for choosing to support one side or the other, often weighing up different arguments before deciding. It might have been about immigration or sovereignty or jobs or wanting to put two fingers up to the establishment because you feel ignored or fearing the economic or political consequences of, of leaving the club. A whole range of factors were at play. No place was 100% for leaving or remaining in the EU. But that said, Social science can help us identify and understand the core beliefs, the core beliefs associated with the way people voted generally. Data which helps explain why feelings ran so high and which might help identify what healing, the Prime Minister talks about the need for that, what healing might look like. At this point, I want to thank uh, Kelly Beaver, along with her team at Ipsos Mori, who, ahead of this speech, helped me devise some questions to test my argument and very generously put them into the field. So thank you to them. And some exclusive new data for you tonight. So I wanted to test the, the two visions or worldviews theory. And so we, we devised a series of propositions and asked which came closest to people, people's view. Oh, there's the, slide for, uh, there's the slide for Kelly. Thanks very much, Kelly. Right. Influences from other countries and other cultures make Britain a better place to live. 56% of Remain voters picked that, just 23% of Leave voters. Now, the alternative proposition was influences from other countries and other cultures threaten the British way of life. And there, the same story, Remain voters, 18%, Leave voters, 52%. So we tried it another way, asking if people agreed with this statement. Britain will be stronger in the future if it sticks to its tradition and way of life. Remain 14% went along with that. Leave 56%. These are stark differences. The alternative proposition we tested was Britain will be stronger in future if it is open to changes and influences from other cultures and other countries. 58% of Remain supporters agreed with that. Among Leave voters, it was 22%. And as I said earlier, I, we must not be overly dogmatic about this difference, but I think it is reasonable to say that Brexit, the Brexit vote did broadly align with the two visions uh, of the country that I mentioned earlier. If you voted Leave, you are more likely to associate with a precious way of life that requires protection from white cliffs and rocky shores. If you voted Remain, you are more likely to celebrate a spirit that, that looks out to the wider world for opportunity. What the Brexit debate did was force people to choose a side and reveal, often for the first time, something significant about their core principles, their core beliefs the kind of country they wanted to live in. In 2018, I commissioned a big survey for the BBC to answer what I called the English question. I wanted to understand people's sense of identity in England and the attributes or values that underpinned those identities, particularly in the light of the Brexit referendum uh, result. We did, I must say, smaller surveys, surveys in other parts of the United Kingdom. Of course we did. I work for the British Broadcasting Corporation. have to do that. But my particular interest was in England, which I felt and, and still feel is, the, is the, really the conundrum at the centre of the union. Working with YouGov on this occasion, we designed a survey which was put to 20,000 people across England. So it's a seriously chunky bit of work. 
So here are a few of the results from that, which I think reinforce the findings uh, from the Ipsos Mori survey questions. We asked about uh, diverse cultural life as a contributor to identity. Remain voters emerged as significantly more likely to say England's diversity was a strong part of their identity, 62% uh, compared to 38%. Do you feel European? Unsurprisingly, perhaps, almost half of Remain voters said they had a strong European identity among Leave voters. It was just 8%. I mean, maybe in the context of the post-referendum, but still, it's a surprisingly small number. More than half of Leave voters said England's history and heritage contributed very strongly on this occasion to their sense of identity among Remain voters. It was just under a third. It's a similar story with tradition, again, very strongly, 40% of Leave voters, 22% of Remain voters. And the Christian tradition was important to 29% of Leave voters, but 47% of Leave voters, 29% of Remain voters. That I think there's a story emerging here. And there is one other very striking difference that emerged. Um, we asked whether people thought England was better in the past, best right now, or had its best years in the future. Among those who voted to leave, two-thirds thought England was better in the past. Among Remain voters, it was one-third. Roughly half the country overall uh, thought England was better in the past, and only 17%, incidentally, thought its best years lay ahead. Now, we also did, as I said, representative polls in Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, and we asked that same question. Did you think that your nation was better in the past, best right now, or better in the future? And what was really interesting is that in, in each of those countries, many more people said they thought their best years lay in the future than lay in the past. England emerged as very different from the rest of the UK on this one measure. Leave voters in England emerge as, as we've seen, as prouder of their English identity, but with a strong sense that England is not the country it used to be, a nostalgia, perhaps, for, for bygone times, a feeling that their identity was losing its specialness, maybe, that it was threatened. It won't surprise you to learn uh, that there was a noticeable Brexit divide in our poll when it came to whether people felt more English or more British. Three quarters, 75%. Oh, that's not right. Did I? Why is that there? Um, anyway, that's quite interesting. So there's pride in being English. 44% of Remain voters uh, are, are proud to be English. 75% of Leave voters, as I recall, of that 44%, 11%. Uh, percent said they were positively embarrassed to be English. So Leave voters, yes, they emerge as prouder of their English nationality, that nostalgia for uh, bygone times. And Leave voters were more than twice as likely to say that they felt more English than British, 47% to 22%, and they were half as likely to say they felt more British than English, 15% to 32%. So I think we can see that there is clearly a correlation between the Brexit vote and whether you feel English or whether you feel British. I wanted actually to consider that English-British divide uh, a bit more generally. So our t survey tested the relative strengths of people's uh, relationship with English identities. I'm sure you've come across this kind of survey data many times uh, before. Our service is 20,000 people in England, so as I say, big and chunky. It suggests that 80% of the residents of England identify strongly as English, but it also finds a similar proportion, 82%, identify strongly as British. Only small proportions, I should say, said they were one but not the other. British and English identities are, are intertwined. They are, they are strands of the same national thread. Now, you will have read this. Some have suggested that the British identity is currently being strangled by rising English nationalism. But that idea was not borne out by my survey. Indeed, the British identity is felt strongly by all generations. In fact, exactly the same proportion, 83% of both 18 to 24-year-olds and 50 to 64-year-olds report a powerful association with Britain. 
Britishness emerges as a strong national characteristic across almost every demographic that we looked at, politics, education, class, and geography. The English identity, however, is felt much more variably. We asked about pride in being English and found a clear generational divide. Among the young, a minority, 45%, said they were proud to call themselves English. But look at that. Among the over, 60, or one of the over 65s, almost three quarters felt pride in being English. And interestingly, this is the reverse of the experience in Wales, where the strength of the Welsh identity reduces with age. I mean, it's not an ongoing thing. I suspect this is to do with Welsh being taught in, in schools in more recent years, but quite an interesting alternative view. In Scotland, actually, pride in being Scottish is pretty much universal across all the age groups. Uh, people said they felt very strongly Scottish. 80% of all the age groups felt that. So I think we can say that being English tends to be seen as an exclusive identity, a birthright, a white Anglo-Saxon identity, traditional Christian. And that, of course, has consequences for the way that ethnic minorities relate to the English identity. Among white people, 61% were proud to be English. Among the BME respondents, just 32% said the same. Many remember how the flag of St. George was co-opted by the far right during the 70s and 80s. But, you know, despite real efforts to rehabilitate the English identity, it still does not enjoy general support across racial groups. Ethnic minorities were much happier to describe themselves as British. 73% of BMEs said they had a strong British identity. And, you know, given that 46% of BME people said they had a strong identity with another country outside the UK, I think that figure is really quite impressive. If English is an exclusive identity, British is a much more inclusive identity. We need to be careful about the difference between identity and nationality here. The difference between a, a psychological sense of belonging and a kind of technical bureaucratic status. I do, I do sometimes worry that when we collect this data on identity, we, we, we may miss the point, and I'm probably as guilty as anyone. Some people asked about their identity will see the question less as delving into their inner sense of self, which is obviously what we all want, and more as a quiz on official definitions. So, do you feel strongly British? Oh, I know, I know that one. Uh, don't tell me. Don't, um, yes, obviously, totally. Um, I have a British passport. I'm a citizen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. On the other hand, even if you're not eligible for a British passport, you might feel that the label reflects a personal commitment to the UK, a decision to settle and put down roots. The English identity might simply be seen as a consequence of being born in England, living in England, or even speaking English. For some people, the question is weird. They've never thought about their identity that way. They would describe themselves maybe by their town or their county or their region, their place in the family. I'm a mum or a dad, partner, carer, grandparent, by their job or religion or ethnicity or their hobbies. I'm a stamp collector. I'm a brother. I'm an Arsenal fan. Identity can be seen as the detail printed on your ID or, or something visceral that rests in your, in your soul. The term has its roots, of course, in the Latin word idem, meaning the same. It is a reflection of sameness, similarity. Who is like me? But it is also about drawing a line around yourself, who's not like me. Identity might be seen, like the, uh, the BBC reorganization, as a, as a Venn diagram, I suspect. I remember, as a, as a young boy, amusing myself by writing my address like this. Mark Easton, my bedroom, my house, Bears Den, Glasgow, Scotland, United Kingdom, Europe, planet Earth, Milky Way, universe. 
quite a few will have done the same thing. It was a, a way of defining myself, visualizing my identity as sort of concentric circles of territorial belonging. I was both a resident of my bedroom and of planet Earth, but not obviously a resident of my parents' bedroom or of Venus. I did not belong in those places. Now, you could put this in another way. Uh, me, my family, my street, my neighborhood, my city, my nation, my country, my continent, my planet, my galaxy, infinity. It is a simplistic model and to an audience like you. I feel almost ashamed to put it up. But, but I think it, it helps idiots like me to see where the, where the friction points are. My nation, my country. For me, back in the 1960s, it was Scotland and Britain. Now, of course, there are people who would like to redraw the lines to, to skip that particular concentric circle of belonging. And then there's the sense of belonging to my country, my continent. Again, as we've seen in the very low proportion of Leave voters who say they have a, a European identity, that is a contested junction. Again, there are people who would skip that circle of belonging entirely. And the junction between my country, my continent, and my planet is also controversial. It was Theresa May who said at the Conservative Conference in 2016, if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. To be fair, it was really an argument about globalization and how that had become disconnected from the concerns and interests of ordinary people. But it, it also suggested that identities that don't have limits are not really identities at all. We get lost in a sea of infinity, unable to find our island, our Ithaca, our home. Which brings me to a very important question. So what? It's a question that we don't ask enough and don't answer enough, in my view. It was John Lennon who asked us to imagine that there are no countries or religion, nothing to kill or die for, a brotherhood of man. And it was Mark Twain who said, the universal brotherhood of man is our most precious possession. And here, because I thought you might like to be reminded of former British glories and couldn't resist it, is a picture of Brotherhood of Man, the, the singing group which won the Eurovision Song Contest in 1976 with the classic, Save Your Kisses for Me. Um, enough nostalgia for the past and <laughs> bygone days. Look, the, the point here is that wars are fought over many things power and money and prestige and hunger and religion and borders and territories, but really they are fought over identities, the lines we draw on maps and in our heads that define us and them. If we could just bring ourselves to ignore our differences, the argument goes, lower our flags, see each other as fellow human beings, then the world, as John Lennon said, could live as one. But it may be that human beings are hardwired to recognize or even manufacture differences, to form ourselves into groupings and tribes, and then to compete with each other. A few years ago, an article in Nature looked at warfare in chimpanzees. Jane Goodall's pioneering work, you may remember, in the 1970s, had revealed how chimps organized themselves into warring gangs, raiding each other's territory, leaving mutilated bodies on the battlefield. This new research, published in Nature, suggested there was evolutionary benefit in this behavior, rewarding the winners with food, mates, and the opportunity to pass on their genes. Few people, I think, probably identify themselves strongly as a great ape, could be on that address list, I suppose. But it might be that this part of our identity helps explain why exclusive identities matter so much to us. They play to a, a, a primeval part of ourselves, in a way. 
in a way that, that more inclusive identities don't. It does seem that we are driven to emphasize our differences, differences which make us feel distinctive and special and perhaps make us feel superior. When I met the legendary American social scientist, Robert Putnam, there he is, some 15 years ago, he took me aside and revealed almost conspiratorially, I remember, he whispered it to me, he said, Mark, birds of a feather flock together. Segregation was natural, that's what he was saying. We like to surround ourselves with people who are like us. The reason for the conspiratorial tone was that Putnam, who, I'm sure many of you know this, but he famously chronicled the decline of US social capital in, in Bowling Alone, his book, was trying to explain his new research, which in the short term at least, showed a negative correlation between diversity and community cohesion. He told me, that in diverse neighborhoods, people of all races tended to, in his words, hunker down. Trust is lower, altruism and community cooperation rarer, friends fewer. Now, more recent research looking at super diverse London concluded the opposite, with a very important difference in methodology. Once you took account of deprivation and segregation, the authors found social cohesion was significantly higher in more ethnically diverse neighborhoods. Now we are talking London here, of course, and as the research team accepted, that is one of a kind. But this contradiction in two pieces of research is, to me, an answer to the so what question I posed just now. If we can understand identity, the descriptors that show us how communities and societies label and think of themselves, we can use that information as an early warning system for potential tensions in the social fabric before they tear. I want to return to the idea of exclusive and inclusive identities. Some identities have a higher bar than others. Of course they do. Being a cockney requires you to have been born within the sound of bow bells. Being an Arsenal fan requires you to do no more than root for the team. But I think it's fair to say that exclusive identities become more attractive when people feel threatened. The hunkering down that Putnam told me about. We flock together to feel safer, to circle the wagons perhaps, to defend ourselves. Inclusive identities tend to be more associated with confidence and optimism in who we are and our ability to, to deal and prosper from change. And they can act as a form of resilience. In the late 19th and early 20th century, with the social and economic tensions of economic, of industrialization and globalization threatening to tear apart the fabric of, of British life in the same way that people had watched it happen in other parts of Europe. There was a concerted drive to manufacture some inclusive identities. We did a lot of manufacturing in those days, and there was, there was frankly, an almost a production line in, in, in new identities in Britain. Clubs and societies sprang up all over the place. Beekeepers, pigeon fanciers, bell ringers, dog lovers all got their own membership associations, many with badges, coats of arms, identities for all. Then there was sports, tennis clubs, rugby clubs, boxing clubs, football clubs, an explosion of new bodies promoting healthy competition and affiliation across social divides. Arsenal was founded in 1886. And... Uh, I couldn't no stop myself noticing there that uh, I've given it the biggest badge. Uh, apologies there. So today, we are experiencing the tensions from globalization and new ways of working uh, again. A sense of powerlessness and disaffection that may increase as technology and shifts in labor markets feeds a sense of threat. My answer would be that we need to nurture and build inclusive identities for the 21st century, just as our Victorian ancestors did in the 19th century. We need social capital factories 
not the exclusive bubbles of so much social media, but creating opportunities for people to realize that, that while we have characteristics that make us special, we have, as the MP Joe Cox so memorably put it, more in common than that which divides us. Or to put it another way, look, they may be deluded, they may be wrong, but some of my best friends are Tottenham supporters. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Now I'd like to invite Maria Sobolewska to join us on stage. Maria is Professor of Political Science at the University of Manchester and has focused in her work on identity and integration, including being the lead investigator on the ESRC UK and a Changing Europe project on political identity. Maria, please join us up here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. And I particularly enjoyed the vivid presentation that accompanied it. Uh, thank you so much. It is very hard to follow, especially that I don't have any exciting badges or anything else to show you. Um, I also feel a sense of great responsibility having heard this talk because uh, Mark said, and I jotted it down here, that social science can help us understand the reasons why people voted a certain way and therefore uh, help us identify the healing and what form that healing might take in our society. I think this is an extremely grave responsibility for social sciences. And I think as we try to look into such a polarizing and such a politically loaded area as identity politics, as identities in society, identity divisions, there are huge risks for social sciences, for social scientists as individuals who have their own opinions, who have their own identities, but also, as we try to engage with a moving uh, target, we lean into perhaps too much into the social media narratives. Maybe we lean too much into the very fast moving uh, media, main media narratives that speed our work beyond what we think differentiate, uh, differentiates our work as careful, slow, scholarly research versus very quick responses to topics of today. And so, with that in mind, uh, I am hesitantly going to try and offer three insights that I think social sciences offer that relate to this area of identities and I think do help us understand and maybe identify those ways of healing um, that uh, Mark referred to. Uh, I also uh, remember from very many years ago, I did as a graduate student some teaching training and I have been told that the audience can only remember three things. So this is why only three insights, there are more. Um, so the first one, I guess, is uh, coming back to Mark's uh, fantastic point about apes. This is a very appealing metaphor and I think a lot of people would kind of immediately say, yes, this makes sense. But actually, when you look at social science research into identities, what you learn is that there is more to it. Uh, we have been studying this tendency for humans, uh, the great apes, but slightly different than chimpanzees, to segregate themselves into groups, into us, and into them, the outgroups, um, for almost uh, 150 years. And the first person to give it a name was an American sociologist, William Graham Sumner, and he called it ethnocentrism, uh, which is quite a mouthful, but it is actually a very simple concept. He describes this as the view of things which one's own group is the center of everything. And he used it to explain everything from traditions, from having that sense of self, I am an Arsenal supporter, I am a British person, I am a Londoner or a Mancunian in my case. Um, and he did uh, say, just like uh, that Nature article and just like uh, Mark just said, he said it's a universal tendency. However, research since has proven it wrong. It is a universal characteristics of societies that that tendency is present in every society studied thus far. However, not all individuals have that tendency. And I think this distinction gives us a huge pointer towards those ways of healing. Because when you think about it, that not all individuals have the tendency to think in terms of in-group and out-group, and moreover, my in-group is better and their out-group is worse, and even a step further thinking that out-group therefore needs killing or uh, you know, colonizing or whatever, 
if we move towards that thinking that not everybody in society has that tendency, then it is a massive ray of sunshine uh, and hope that we can offer. And for example, uh, most uh, research, and of course this varies, but most research agrees that actually only about a third of us have that tendency. And then when you think about what does it mean for societies, it means this. This is the loud minority. And I think this is a story that we have seen with a lot of recent political developments, certainly one of the reasons why we have seen an EU referendum and the way that it has developed, the way that the campaign has been run. One of the reasons why this is a minority, one third of our population, but it is the louder minority, is because they do feel that sense of threat. They feel threatened by people who do not belong to their group. Uh, and another excellent American researcher called Karen Stenner has brought uh, this vision of a red button. These people live their lives being entirely friendly with Tottenham supporters and going happily along their uh, you know, daily lives and routines. But there is a red button. If a Tottenham supporter rubbishes Arsenal, the red button is pressed in a way that somebody who doesn't have a red button can probably still continue having pints uh, after the game which Tottenham won uh, with the opposition. So that red button is there and sadly our politicians know it and they do like to press that button. And I think it is a great responsibility of social sciences to try to uh, criticize it, uh, call it out and try to uh, create a spirit of opposition. As a result of that red button, as a result of that threat, it is, in fact, I think, the other way around to what Mark just said about exclusive nature of certain identities. I don't actually believe that there are identities that are more exclusive than others. They are just identities that the people who have just been threatened are flocking to. And so English identity nowadays is one of those identities. I think the rising immigration has pressed that red button, the politicians have lent into it, and kept pressing the button, and therefore the English identity has become temporarily, hopefully, uh, quite an exclusive identity. But even thinking about our past and not so long ago, the British identity wasn't in fact seen as very inclusive uh, after the Second World War, when a lot of the ethnic minorities who now feel very British were coming into this country, many were saying that the British identity is very colonial and it is in fact exclusive. It is a white colonial dominant identity. And in fact, there was a big project to reinvent Britishness as this more civic, more inclusive identity. So I think we need to engage uh, in a similar exercise with English identities and possibly other identities as well. I think a great ex uh, example maybe would be the Scottish identity uh, currently, which has the reputation of being much more inclusive. But actually, when you look at the kinds of people who support Scottish identity, they are often very similar to the people who say they feel very strongly English. It is a political project creating that identity um, for us. The second, uh, I guess, slightly related insight is the role of education. So we all know the statistic, I think, that people who are highly educated were less likely to vote to leave the EU and much more likely to vote remain. We also know that these people have different values and opinions uh, to people who don't have um, f formal education past uh, school leaving age. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the why or how this might, uh, might, ha might have happened, but into what happens when people get that higher education. And I think this is very important these people who have higher education are not different just because they don't have the red button or are less likely to have it. They actually have a motivation to try to control the button. They have a motivation to try to be more inclusive. These are the people who self-consciously examine their prejudices and want to do it. And they often get criticized for being self-conscious about this, but I think this is how our societies become more liberal. And I think social science may be paying slightly more attention to these people, amplifying their views as well as a counterbalance to focusing on uh, those less tolerant, more exclusive, and more threatened part of society would offer a very good idea how to improve our society today, how to uh, foster that healing. And then finally, um, 
one of the big things that we are all guilty of, I think, both as social scientists and uh, media, possibly also politicians, is the fact that we do ignore people in the middle. So there, are the, there is this one third of our population in all societies or most societies that are easily threatened. They have the tendency of grouping people, thinking us and them type thoughts. And yet we have on the other side an increasing uh, number of people who have the motivation to fight those biases openly and self-consciously. <coughs> but in the middle, the vast majority of our society is in the middle. Sorry, I need water. Sorry. <laughs> Now, if you will allow me to shamelessly plug my forthcoming book yeah. <laughs> called Brexitland uh, that I've written with Rob Ford. Um, one of the big points that we make in that book um, is that one of the reasons why we have ended up in this um, apparent identity crisis today is because the politicians have been leaning into paying much more attention into that one third of our population who was very angry and very threatened and not giving enough voice both to the silent middle but also to the liberal uh, and less threatened, more inclusive end of the society. And I think as social scientists, it is now upon us to try to amplify those views as well and try to stop the small minority leading the way forward forever. Thank you. Well, thank you for some uh, interesting points. Um, in certainly Northern Ireland, uh, look, I absolutely share uh, the, the, the people of Northern Ireland's frustration at times at uh, uh, the way we kind of talk about Britain when we really mean the United Kingdom. Ha however, I, I, I think my fond of feeling about the, the Britain-United Kingdom thing is that Britain is shorthand for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That, that is a word we use to cover the UK. And uh, I, I know that there'll be people who disagree and that we should always use the phrase UK, but um, we, I work for the British Broadcasting Corporation and we cover Northern Ireland as well, so I, I think you could, they can probably feel included. Um, but undoubtedly, the uh, you know, identity policies of Northern Ireland are, are, are well above my pay grade, so I'm not going to go there. I think we have to remember Arsene Wenger got forced out of Arsenal, and um, and and that's in the end because uh, he could not uh, keep, as it were, sort of both traditions together in in a, in a way. He couldn't keep the support of the supporters across across the piece. Um, and I think what we really need is is not just one Arsene Wenger, but you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals who are all working away uh, to try and uh, you know, improve social cohesion, community relations, whatever you want. Um, so I, I, I don't think that um, we're going to find our, our, our new Wenger, however much I might like to have him back. I think in today's world, it's fair to say that we have fairly diffuse leadership structures. And I think some people criticize us all for living in some kind of bubble. But actually, being a leader in your own bubble is a way forward. And I think, um, especially as social scientists, we should try to expand the bubble rather than completely uh, set ourselves impossible standards, but or also shrink and uh, look inward only. So trying to communicate, and I think this was something that um, Mark was actually introduced as this great translator, and I think this is why these kinds of events are so important, that we talk to people who have that immediate connection with the public, the journalists, about our research, but in an engaging and open fashion without you know, overcomplicating things, both with arcane language statistics and uh, you know, nuancing everything into, into death and dissolution. Um, so yeah, so these kind of opportunities, I think we should do more of that. Really not expert enough to talk about relative deprivation theory. Um, 
but I, it does sound to me like a, a, a really interesting piece of work, and if, if someone can demonstrate to me that actually we can understand the, the, the pessimism, the sense of disconnectedness and powerless that I've encountered uh, on numerous trips around uh, England and other parts of the United Kingdom, then you know, I'd be really keen to give that, uh, give that coverage, so thank you very much for that. brilliant observation actually on, on the planet and this idea of being a citizen of the world. As I, I said, you know, uh, Theresa May got, got criticised for, for, for suggesting that there was no such thing and of course there was a backlash. Actually I suspect that this idea of sort of a planetary identity, um, when, I, when I, I was probably thinking of myself aged sort of six or seven, so probably mid-60s, uh, mid-1960s, um, uh, pr probably after Apollo 11, really, after that sense of being able to see the planet from outside. I think that was a massive moment for, for humankind and our kind of identity with the planet. But of course, you're absolutely right, the sense of a planet under threat now, a sense of the planet generationally uh, as well, needing to pull mm. together to, to protect itself. Um, clearly, that's going to have a powerful impact on that particular identity. It's probably uh, something that we, you know, maybe some social scientists somewhere might want to, want to take a look at, but a really good point. Actually, this is another, I think, helpful insight from social science that could do with more kind of amplification out there. Because actually, apart from that one third that does have the red button at the ready, most people's immediate response is not to panic. And so we have quite a lot of research now emerging from uh, sadly, a, a, you know, quite a series of terrorist, very serious terrorist attacks uh, in America and Europe. And um, kind of luckily in a horrible sense, uh, there were various surveys in the field during, uh, before and right after those attacks. And what we have learned from this, uh, analyzing those surveys, is that actually most people do not have exclusionary responses and most people do not start um, looking at, uh, for example, Muslim um, people in any other way than they were before. And in fact, some people on this spectrum, more liberal spectrum, who have the strong motivation to control prejudice, they actually temporarily have a more positive view of Muslims. Uh, and obviously we're talking about um, kind of uh, Islamic um, uh, attacks. And it is only later on, after the elite narratives go on and on, that people then go into the ne overall uh, negative views of those outgroups. But actually, most people do not have an impulse to panic. And I think this is such a huge finding that we should really all know, and a great ray of hope. I just think, I mean, it's not, as you quite rightly really say, it's not really my area, but um, I suppose this might be my kind of final thought too. Um, you know, uh, We've talked about d divisions, and and I've talked, uh, you know, produced uh, data this evening, which I think demonstrates that there is a sort of fundamental worldview, core value, core belief divide in this country, which, you know, if we don't recognise it and think about it and and work to heal it, could become very damaging. Um, but I, I I do think that there is also there's a risk that we overstate things actually and not realise that. You know, Britain is not America. That's one of the important things. Our society is not as divided in, uh, in, in that way. There are many things on which there is pretty much unanimity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about broadly NHS, I'd say the welfare state broadly, taxation too. I mean, we'll always find people who disagree, but I think, I think there is an opportunity there. And I think the key, the key to healing in this is respectful disagreement. It is how we don't try and convince other people that they're wrong um, and that they're foolish for, for having the views that they do. Uh, we don't have to agree with them, but we do have to accept that they are entitled to have a different view to us, and we need to listen properly. Mm. We need, there's a 
a thing some of you may know called deep listening. It's a way of actually trying to, to really understand what somebody is saying to you. We're not very good at deep listening, certainly. Uh, I think sometimes journalists are not very good at deep listening. But, but I do think that you know, a, a, a thought to go away with tonight is that when it comes to identities and the things that, that make us different in terms of, of ideas and our backgrounds and um, uh, our, our worldview, our core beliefs, it is really important that we don't this is why I think it's so, so important that we don't divide the country up into leave and remain in the way that we have discussed it. We must do everything we can to recognise that there's a bit of all this in all of us. And that allows a much easier route into what I would describe as respectful disagreement. Um, and if our politicians can do that, then really you know, uh, uh, things can be much more optimistic. Great. Well, uh, excellent note to end on. A bit of optimism there at the end, well, I think, which I think is uh, uh, deserved, actually, in the situation that we are. We have to hold on to that sense of optimism because it does reflect the reality in how people think and identify. So uh, that's it for the session. All I wanted to do to round up was to thank you, first of all, uh, for coming uh, this evening. Really appreciate your input and uh, questions. Thank you to the team at the Academy and the campaign for putting on the event uh, tonight. Thanks, of course, again to Sage Publishing for their excellent support of this event. And finally, uh, thank you to Maria and Mark, our excellent contributors tonight. Thank you both. <laughs>